Exodus chapter 12. It's, this is about the Passover in Exodus 12. Four weeks ago I preached on it about the lamb that was to be sacrificed. God was going to bring, the death angel was going to pass through Egypt and kill the firstborn of every home and the firstborn of every animal unless they celebrated the Passover. So Exodus chapter 12, let's just review. Jesus, at the Last Supper, he tells his disciples, we're going to celebrate the Passover, and let me give you the fuller, deeper meaning of what the Passover means. And then he instituted the Lord's Supper. But you understand it's really just the Passover with a deeper significance. So Exodus chapter 12. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number, (coughs) excuse me, the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. Verse 5. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. Of course, I shared with you that the lamb that they were to sacrifice is a picture of Christ. It was symbolic of of Jesus. He's a male. They had to take a year-old male, a year-old Male lamb would be in the prime of life. Jesus was in the prime of life. And he is the son of God. And it had to be a lamb without defect. Just as Jesus was without sin. And so they slaughtered their lambs. Verse 6. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month. When all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames, like a cross, of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire. As I told you, that's because the lamb, Jesus Christ, suffered the fires of hell, God's judgment for our sin on the cross. And I mentioned how there was no, there's no water in hell, so it cannot be boiled in water. But roasted over a fire, verse 10. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt. And strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood. When I see the blood. The cross. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where we get the Passover. I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So Jesus tells his disciples, his 12, or Judas leaves, the 11 disciples, you know, I've wanted to celebrate the Passover with you. But now let me tell you, you know, as John the Baptist said, Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. Jesus was like, for a thousand years, you've been celebrating the Passover. You've been sacrificing a lamb. But that's me. And this cup represents the blood that you've been sacrificing the lamb and putting the blood on the cross. That that blood speaks of my death for your sins. So Jesus was bringing the full, the spiritual meaning out of, of the Passover. Just as they put the blood on the door and judgment passed over, it didn't matter how good or evil they were in their homes. It's by the blood. And so, too, when we ask Jesus Christ into our heart, as it says in Hebrews, 
his blood is applied to our souls, our heart, like the doorway into our bodies, our temples of the Holy Spirit. So the blood is on our soul, and God's judgment passes over us. The blood says, the death of Jesus, I paid for their sins. And by you asking Christ into your heart, the blood is upon your soul. God's judgment passes over you. So we're going to pass out the cup, but let's pray for a moment. Let's, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and I, I just I want to pray a simple prayer. If, if you've either never given your heart to Jesus or just a time to recommit our lives to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are saved by grace through faith. And it's not by our good works or deeds. Because we are sinful people. Jesus, we ask that you would come into our heart and be our Savior and our Lord. Put your blood upon our souls. We thank you that God's judgment passes over us and that we get to live in heaven for all eternity. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to pass out the cup. If you believe in Jesus Christ and he is your savior, um, please feel free to take a cup. And wait till we all have, and then we're going to partake together as one body. Back to Exodus chapter 12. I want to talk about the bread. That's why I switched it. So Exodus chapter 12. And I want you to... Um, Let's start in verse 8 and look at the bread that they have for the Passover. It would be the bread that Jesus would have. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made, what? Without yeast. So come on down to uh, verse 14. This is a day you are to commemorate the Passover. The Jews commemorate this day once a year. For the generations to come, and you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without what? Without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. Verse 17. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast. From the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, whether foreign or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. I think God says it like eight times. Did you pick up the message? What kind of bread should it be? Unleavened without yeast. All right. I did have some jokes. I wasn't going to share the jokes with you, but I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll take one minute. What did the slice of bread say to the other slice of bread when he saw butter and jam on the table? We're toast. All right, I try. Why did the rich man sell yeast? He wanted to raise some dough. And the last one, I know, these are, these are called good, clean <sighs> Christian jokes. What happens if you eat yeast and shoe polish? 
I heard it. Yeah, you will rise and shine. Okay. So that's a yeast. That's a package. I, I don't totally understand leaven and yeast, but somehow when you add that to bread, there's a chemical reaction that causes the bread to puff up with air and, and stuff, and it changes it. You heard a, yeast, a little bit of yeast works through the whole dough, and, and, it, and it puffs it up. So on the, let's see, on your right is unleavened bread, and... On our left is a piece of, you know, is a loaf of bread that has leaven and yeast in it that made it puff up into that delicious loaf of bread, okay? Everyone with me? But for the Passover, God was like, the bread that you use for the Passover for seven days, no yeast, no leaven, in fact, you need to search your homes to make sure there isn't even any yeast in your home. And the Jews, to this day, follow this. this is, these are the rules that the Jews follow for Passover every year in 2019. This is just a, this is an old drawing of the women searching for yeast in their home in order to get rid of it, in order to celebrate the Passover. But here are their rules. So every Jewish family um, is following these rules. Clean all possible locations where leaven might have been eaten or might be found in the house. This means searching for crumbs under the cushions of your sofa and stuffed chairs, the pockets of your coats and pants, on closet floors, and so on. Anywhere you were eating bread and some crumbs of that bread fell into your sofa, you got to go get it, okay? So the women and men, whatever, on Passover, they're, they're vacuuming and cleaning and searching their whole house for leaven. Rule two, empty and scrub down the entire refrigerator to remove all traces of leaven. This includes washing out the freezer as well. Rule three, your entire oven and stove must be scrubbed down and then turned on for over one hour at the highest temperature. A microwave oven can be cleansed by boiling water put inside it. Four, put away all dishes, silverware, pots, utensils, etc. that are normally used during the year that have touched leaven. And then they have to bring out special pots and dishes that are dedicated that leaven has never touched them. Okay, you with me so far? These are the... Number five, clean your dining room and kitchen tables by pouring boiling water over them and then thoroughly scrubbing them down with soap and water. I wonder how many of them get burned with all this boiling water in the microwave and on the tables and... and then... They actually have, this is part of their rule, they're explaining to their kids why they do this, we are commanded to remove the leaven because it represents a corrupting influence, a hidden uncleanness, like the influence of a small lump of leaven in a batch of dough. Spiritual leaven functions as an evil impulse within us. The yeast in the soul is essentially pride that manifests itself in idolatrous desires and lust. So all through scripture, some theologians would argue that every time leaven and yeast is mentioned in the Bible, every single time, there's one parable, that's, but another time. Every single time, it's evil, it's bad, it's negative, every time yeast is mentioned. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 16. So let's look, just a couple of verses in Matthew and then Mark. Matthew chapter 16, verse 5. Matthew 16, verse 5. And I have a heading in my Bible. Do you got a heading? Is there a heading in your Bible? Something about the yeast? The yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So, verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I'm not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard 
against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, what was the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees? If you come back to chapter 15, I'll start in verse 6. Jesus is working over the Pharisees and Sadducees that their teachings have become man-made rules. So starting in verse 6, Jesus says, They are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your, what? Traditions. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips. So they're at church. They're at the synagogue. They're, they're honoring, they're saying the right things with their lips. But where are their hearts? Far from God. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. They're going through the motions of worship. And their teachings are merely human rules. So Jesus says you've got to watch out for the yeast of religiosity where people play at being church being religion there's nothing necessarily wrong with traditions and rituals and rules unless they contradict the word of God but unfortunately like yeast through the 2,000 years of church history Many traditions and man-made rules have crept into the church that, have, that actually go against the Word of God. You always have to guard against the yeast of man-made rules that has not gone through the filtering of the Word of God. Be careful. Of, and it grows. For whatever reason, whole Christian denominations are infected with this yeast where it's all kind of a show and, and they go through the motions, but their heart is actually far from the Lord. They actually don't know the word of God. It's all kind of man-made rules and traditions and be careful of the yeast of religiosity and, and playing at religion. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Now a little, he adds something here. Mark chapter 8, verse 14. The disciples have forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of who? Of Herod. Of Herod. Herod represents the government. He's like the governor. He he's, represents politics and, and, and the government. In the Bible, in the New Testament, there are three Herods. There's Herod the Great. That's the one that was running the government in Israel at the time of the birth of Jesus. That's the one that um, when the wise men came looking for Jesus, Herod said, hey, you go to Bethlehem, when you find him, you let me know. I'd like to worship him too. And that's the Herod that then ordered all the boys two years and under in Bethlehem put to death. That's Herod the Great. He passes on, and then Herod Antipas is the governor, and he's the one that's alive when Jesus gets put to the cross. He's the one that Jesus calls that fox Herod. He's the one that puts in his vote with Pilate, crucify Jesus. And then the third Herod, he passes off the scene, the third Herod, Herod Agrippa, that's the Herod that puts the first apostle to death in Acts chapter 12. The first apostle that's put to the sword is James, the brother of John. And James is put to death by Herod Agrippa. Jesus says, watch out for the yeast of Herod or I, I call it the yeast of government, of politics. And you have to understand something, that the church has not done a good job doing this. So I actually like in the United States somewhat that we have this separation between state and religion. 
I, I think that helps us to keep away from the yeast of government. In the world, there are many countries that have what's called, for Christianity, a state religion. That's where the state, the government, actually controls the church. You can find this in England. You can find this in Sweden. You can find this in many different countries. And, and long ago, it used to be every European country. But it's still in many countries in the world and many other countries in South America where the state, the, the government, actually decides what the creed of the church is. The state actually decides who can be pastors and who cannot. The state actually decides what the churches will look like and act like and be like. And you, you understand in all of those cases, that's, that's trouble whenever you have secular government people that control a national church that's controlled by the state. Are you with me? It's, it's, it's trouble, and I just see Jesus warning, watch out for the yeast of government, and, and, and because they cannot, you know, sure I like President Trump. Do I want him to be the spiritual leader of the Christian church in the United States? I don't think so. I'm glad I think he's doing a lot for us, okay, but I, I don't, you know, watch out. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm just praising the Lord that we've got some conservative judges in. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Franklin Graham said that President Trump is the, the best president for Christianity that we've had in a long time. So it's like, wow, it's a great compliment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now this is a weird situation here. So let me read it to you. It, it is, it's unique. Chapter 5, verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Yuck. That is crazy. And you, verse 2, and the church is what? They're proud about this. They're proud that, you know, we're so tolerant, we're so loving, that no matter what sin you have, we'll accept you as... They were Christians. They're saying they're Christians, and the guy is sleeping with his stepmother. Okay, like, whoa. He says, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? Now, I want you to jump to verse 6. Because they're boasting. Paul says in verse 6, you're boasting. You're puffing up uh, on how tolerant you are of every sin that comes down the pike. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new what? unleavened batch as you really are. Now, let me get a little technical here with you for a second. Well, let me, maybe I should read on. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been, what? Sacrificed. Okay, so that's the cup. Represents, they sacrifice the lamb, and they put the blood on the door. Okay, so Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Verse 8, therefore, let us keep the festival, which is now we call communion, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, I, I know this is going to be really technical here. And let me see, I, I think I have a picture. Let me get technical with you. So, when Jesus was doing the Last Supper, you know, he has the cup, 
and, and he has the bread. It's the Passover. It would have been unleavened bread. Now, what does the bread represent? What does, what does Jesus now reveal to his disciples what this bread represents? His body. What does leaven represent? Sin, pride, okay? So does the body of Jesus have any sin? No. So it's un, just like the lamb was without defect, so the bread has no leaven. Because Jesus says, this represents me. This represents my body broken for you. There's no sin. Don't put leaven in this. There's no sin in this. And by the way, the church, and this is, this is technical, the church as a whole represents the body of Christ. And we are called as a church to be holy as well. And so that's what the Apostle Paul is like. Don't be putting up with leaven because it will affect the whole church. We're called to be holy people. I come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So what are we supposed to do before we have communion? Examine ourselves. So let me back up. What does every Jew do before they celebrate the Passover? What do they do in their homes? They're looking for leaven. They go in the closets. Is there any leaven in here? Is there leaven behind the sofa? Is there leaven in the freezer? Is there leaven in the microwave? They search their house. They clean their house from top to bottom to make sure there's no leaven. And they're still doing that to this day. But you understand that for us, this is the house of God. And when we come to communion, God's saying, search Search for leaven in your life. A man, a woman, we ought to examine ourselves. Well, let the Holy Spirit examine ourselves. So here's King David. Here's what he says. But who can discern their own sins? Like, we can be sinful and we don't even discern it ourselves. That's why you need the Holy Spirit, like a, like a light. Forgive my hidden faults. Lord, I need you to forgive. I know I probably have hidden sin in my life that I don't even know. Forgive me my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. Those are sins I know I'm committing. I've got secret sins I don't know I have. And Lord, keep me from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. King David, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's what this leaven's all about. It's not literally now looking for leaven. It's search me, God. Is there is there anything offensive in my life? Reveal it to me. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Let's have the elders. So I have to tell you something. The Jews still practice Passover every year. But they no longer, they stopped in about 70 AD, they stopped 2,000 years ago, 
sacrificing a lamb. Right? For Passover, up until then, the Jews would sacrifice a lamb and put the blood on their doors, like a cross, and they would have unleavened bread. But 2,000 years ago, the Jews stopped the sacrifice of the lamb during Passover. I think it's very symbolic. It's like they've rejected the lamb. They've rejected the message of the cross that God's judgment passes over. Romans says that the Jews have experienced a hardening. They're like blinded. It's like, Jews, don't you see? It's all about Jesus. Don't you get it? Jesus is the Messiah. He, he poured out his blood for your sins, for the forgiveness. And this don't, but they're blinded right now. Now, in the future, their eyes will be opened. Their blindness brings salvation to Gentiles. In the future, I think they'll, they'll realize that this is all about Jesus. But right now, they have no lamb. There's no blood when they do the Passover. The only thing that the Jews do still is the Passover bread. Now, I got this out of Giant Eagle. Giant Eagle sells Passover bread that's made by Jewish people. And I, I bought, there was like four or five different types of, it all looks the same, they call it matzah. And this is the bread, and I wish I could have given you a piece like this, okay? <laughs> so, their bread, they, they make their bread like this on purpose. So, I don't know how well you can see this, but the bread has stripes in it. Now, not only do the machines make that, but even when they make it at home, it will have these stripes. It's hard to see on your little piece, but there's stripes going across. And then if you notice, they have holes in the bread. Do you see the holes? Do you see the holes in your bread? They put those in on purpose. The reason they put those holes in is to make sure that the bread, it doesn't have leaven, it's to really make sure that the bread doesn't puff up. So by putting holes in it, because they're worried that it might puff up a little bit, and then you'll think it has leaven in it, it'll look like, and, and so they, you know, they say like leaven puffs it up in pride, and so they actually put those holes in it to make sure that it doesn't puff up. You with me? So here's Isaiah 53 that is, is a verse that talks about Jesus. This is the verse that they don't like reading. It says, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. They pierce the bread. They pierce it so that there's no pride. It's not puffed up. You know, Jesus said that, um, it says in Philippians, that Jesus laid aside the glory of being the Godhead and became man and became a servant and became nothing in order to die on the cross. There's no pride in Jesus. He, he went to the cross and he was pierced with nails in his feet, his hands in his side, just like the bread is pierced, that the Jews had been piercing a thousand years before even Christ came. And then it says he was crushed for our iniquities. They will crush the bread to make it flat. And the punishment that brought his peace was upon him. And by his stripes, Jesus, before he went to the cross, they whipped his back probably 40 times with stripes. When they make the bread, it has stripes in it. So it's kind of interesting to me, though they don't have the lamb and they don't have the blood, they still practice the unleavened bread. And I'm like, it's all about Jesus. It's, this is the bread Jesus gave to his disciples and says, this is me. This, this represents my body, pierced for your sins. I, I'm going to be whipped and striped. I'm going to be crushed. There's no leaven in it. Remember what I've done for you. Father, um, 
What a powerful message in the symbol of the cup and the bread. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just, Lord, how true your word is. The Old Testament hides the New Testament truth and the New Testament unveils the Old Testament secrets. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body, pierced, beaten, crushed for our sins and for our healing. Bless the bread as we take together. In your name we pray. Amen. Father, we just thank you for gathering us together as a family to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It, uh, the Jews celebrate Passover once a year, but we have a privilege of every month and every so often special occasions to just celebrate the Christian Passover, the Lord's Supper. And what a privilege to just think about what you've done on the cross for us. Bless us as we go. Fill us with your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.